We are back, ladies and gentlemen. Today on the podcast, Violence and Ego. We'll see you in a minute. All right, guys, welcome back. My name is Bill Jones, head instructor, top level martial arts, black belt under Master Pedro Sauer in the art of Gracie Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Coming at you today from beautiful downtown Cuyahoga Falls, where our streets are all torn up and water is flowing from them like crazy. It's a beautiful sight. <laughs> With me, as always, my friend, my co-host, my pal, my chum, slightly nauseated, but still slightly above novice in all things, Mr. Edward Whitney. Ed, how you doing today? I think I might be slightly below novice in everything today. Slightly <laughs> below yeah. novice. Not yeah. not your best day. No, I'm out of the infirmary, but I all had, right. had to get up for the podcast. All right, man. Wait, wait, to, having, wait to stick it out, man. Having our friend in. I didn't want to miss our special guest. Yeah, we have a special guest today. Published author. Published author, fifth degree black belt in Hapkido, Mr. Daniel Arnold. Now, you wrote the book Violence and Ego, right? Ah, uh, yes, I did. Okay, well, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Awesome. So, um, you know, Dan, we're going to talk about a bunch of things. We'll talk about your book a little bit. We'll talk about, you know, the fights over the weekend. Cool. Ed, do we have anything in the news? Nothing nothing off the top of my head yet. I'll see what I can find on the Googles and the interwebs, though, here real quick. Okay. Yeah, as always, we're, we're really, really prepared for everything. <laughs> Normally, we're slightly prepared, like I have this stuff, you know, written down, but like yeah. I said, I... Basically, Ed came in the door about seven minutes ago, completely white, pale face. <laughs> um, you know, I, w I was going to say as white as our wall here, but that doesn't do any of you any good. But, like, we have this really white wall, and he looks... He could just blend into it. Yeah, even my hands are very pale. Yeah. I noticed that when I was driving in. So wow. we're gonna we're gonna need you to speak up, Ed. I know. Sorry, it's tough. sorry. It's very quiet in the infirmary, so I'm used to a hushed tone the last few days. Yeah. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, you know, Dan, you you came in. Like, tell us a little bit about your history. Like, so you've got a fifth degree black belt in Hapkido. How long have you been training? When did you start? What um, got you into it? I started training in martial arts. When I was 10 years old. Okay. Um, then my stepdad made me quit for a while, and then I got back into it when I was 12 and stayed in the rest of my life. Now, what did you start with? Uh, Shoin Ru Hagakiri Jiu Jitsu. Okay. Like a stand up Japanese type of Jiu Jitsu. Sure. It was an Okinawan style. And then, um, you know, I grew up in the 80s, so, you know, ninjas were all over TV, yeah. doing spin, jumping, whatchamacallit kicks on people. Disappearing so, and reappearing. Yeah, and so that's kind of what I did. I went into Taekwondo since I couldn't find any ninjutsu, and I, and I stayed in Taekwondo from that part on. Uh, Mudokwan Taekwondo okay. uh, under Grandmaster Raymond Such, who still has a school someplace on the west side of Cleveland. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much it. And did that and a little bit of judo in college. Did one quarter of that and got an A. And then the Hapkido, which I basically called judo on crack. Um, I, I took a real liking to that because of the grappling aspect and, and for my, my job as a law enforcement officer because you can't be punching people. Yeah, so you, you, you need to restrain So people. you are a retired police officer, yeah, right? Yes, I yeah, retired a little me. early, but I got 25 years altogether. And, oh, wow. That's amazing. So, well, thanks for doing that. And no also, I, sh I should mention a former Marine. Hoorah. You like, bro. <laughs> <laughs> you know, which is among the five best branches in the military. Yes. So he, he's up there. Among the five best? <laughs> yeah. Nice. Yeah, complimentary next time you're going to have to have crayons for me, though. I'm used to crayons. Yeah. So, <laughs> so can you tell us a little bit about Hapkido? Like, I'm kind of a novice when it comes to the art. Can well, you just I'll give you the history of it, and I, and I don't have it as memorized as I used to. Yeah. But basically what happened during the, um, you take the, you know, at one point in time, Korea was occupied by Japan. And actually, Taekwondo, Sh Shotokan, Karate is the father of Taekwondo or, or Tang Soo Do. Okay. And Hapkido, what happened was is there was a judo black belt from Japan, and this was mainland Japan, judo black belt, and he was also an Aki Jiu Jitsu black belt. So joint locks, wrist locks, judos, throwing. Okay. Was really impressed with the striking he had seen from this Korean martial artist. And they got together and decided to try to make a more complete martial art. Okay. With striking and grappling, and they came up with Hapkido. Um, and that's basically the history of Hapkido. Okay. Uh, in a, a quick history. Yeah. Um, 
it's to me I, I jokingly call it judo on crack because when I actually wanted to what I was able to use of it in real life mm -hmm. was more of the judo-ish type stuff in it okay um, wrist locks wrist compressions wrist locks that kind of stuff that was good if I was wrestling with somebody and I had another cop or two helping me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but like for one on one, it was always the more judo ish type stuff in within Hapkido. And luckily, that's most of the stuff I would work on live. Okay, so when you say judo ish, judo ish type stuff, what what exactly do you mean? I, I'm talking about the uh, reaps and sweeps. Okay. okay. Um, like a sotogaris if it was, okay. if, you know, uh, uchimadas. Okay. Like uh, taking the opponent's legs out from under. Trip. Yeah, yeah. Like, like trips and like push the tops and knock out the bottom, and they fall. Make over. a foot light and then take it. Yeah, it makes yeah. perfect sense. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, sounds great. Because I know, I know the first time I rolled you, I was like the around here we always have new guys roll an instructor or somebody, right? Just to see, and I know I was pleasantly surprised. Like I could honestly tell that you were very far from a novice. Just you know what I mean. By I a lot of the things I you appreciate were doing. that because I feel like I'm a novice uh, well, in jujitsu. <laughs> I really am. In, in the but, particular game of jujitsu, maybe. Yeah. But I mean, just in the way you were moving, your grappling ability. Do you know what I mean? It's, yeah, I appreciate. You, you that. have what what I call kinesthetic awareness, meaning you yes. know where your body is in yes. space. Nice. Yeah, you which is something that a lot well. of novices don't have. Yeah, right. I could tell. Um, I could tell. You, you know, like you might say, okay, move your right hip, and they they're like picking up their left hand and it's like that is not your hip but they think they're moving yeah. their right hip yeah, like i don't know what yeah, you think one, you're one doing, of the things it's... i really loved about here and this is like a uh, this can be a dilemma for a lot of martial artists is you know i, I come in and hey, have you trained before and oh i didn't want to be like well i've done a little yeah and, and then you see me move and, and you're like this guy's sandbagging he's done a little yeah. bit more than a little yeah. but you don't want to come in and be like you know i'm, I'm bruce I'm, I'm bruce <laughs> lee you know and i train you, know, you want to come in talking all that crap either so it's well, kind if of you a, came in and told me it, that Bruce Lee. It's a like, nice balance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's there's a medium balance to try yeah. to find and yeah. yeah. I could tell instantly, just like I said, just from your movements and your top pressure, things like that. I could tell this guy had definitely done a lot of martial arts. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Um one of the things I did want to talk about before we before because I do want to there's a couple things in your book I noticed and then I'd like to talk about cool. get you talking about that. Sure. But uh how about Mighty Mouse? Oh my goodness! How, how <laughs> seriously though? This is funny because all I could think of when I was watching the highlights was Ed just said on the last podcast that this might be the best martial artist alive. Yeah, I. Stand and then by he that pulls statement. off Uranagi straight to the armbar. It was insanity. Yeah, and and I just want to point out for anybody who doesn't know what I'm talking about, and I forget I, he's Demetrius Johnson. Is that his name? Yes. Okay, yes. I got it right. Yes, Demetrius so, Johnson. DJ. DJ. Right? If you just call him DJ. Um, but Mighty Mouse is yes. what everybody calls him. And, yep. and uh, he pulled off, like he gets behind a guy and starts what looks like a suplex and stops mid-go because the guy basically splayed out to not get suplexed. And just armbarred him like midair. Yes. And by the time he hit the ground, he was cranking on this arm. And this guy, actually, I'll give the guy credit. He survived the armbar for a good 15 seconds. So trying to get south. Yeah, yeah and, and then he takes south. it to the south hip, yeah, and it's it was over. over. Yeah. But, uh, you know, watching it, I don't think there was ever an intention of a suplex. No. I, so there's, there's, a, there's a judo throw called urinage, which, which kind of looks like a suplex, but it's not. Yeah. Um, you you kind of turn halfway through it. So you drive, you're behind the guy, you drive your hips in, and then lift, and then you kind of turn over and, and turn your chest over, and it yes. allows for what he... He did. It, so, but his heads up ability on that was yeah. absolutely insane. So let me paint the picture. I'm laying on the couch, literally have a bowl of soup in one hand, pile of tissues on the floor, and I'm watching this fight live. You know, I'm eating soup. All right. So I'm eating soup, but I'm still watching the fight, and I'm laying on the couch, got a blanket, you know. And as he hits this move, like I can see everything he's doing. Like if you watch it, his <clears> hand <throat> actually comes up to his ear. Yeah. Like when we do the arm bar from the back. During the suplex, he brings his hand up to his ear, turns, and jumps into the arm bar. So I spill my soup all over the living room floor. <laughs> and I kind of hop up sort of, and I'm like, oh, my God. But yes. Did he have that hook? He, he had that hook under the arm. Yeah. And that's when he brought he the came hand up. up and... So when he went for the, what is it again? Uranagi. Okay. The guy did, like, I call it the starfish defense, where they kind of throw their arms and legs out to prevent from getting suplexed, making right. themselves heavy. And at that moment, he brought his arm up and got the underhook and took his hand all the way to his ear as he turned and then was able to hop into the arm bar. Yeah. Now, I was watching uh, Gracie Breakdown of this, and they, they seem to believe that, um, and I agree just by after watching the clip enough times, that, that like he had no intention to suplex um, because the suplex really doesn't end the fight. Not, not, in, not in the UFC cage, right? Because it's, 
Yeah, they bounce. On concrete, sure, it's going to yes. end a fight, right? But, right, but like, right, right. in the cage, it doesn't end the fight. It just becomes a huge scramble after that. Yeah, they bounce and, and get to their feet. And you're pretty much guaranteed to win the round, but he, like, he was already winning every round. He, he was going to win that fight no matter what. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, so, so they, they're like, he had no intention to suplex. Mm-mm. They believe that he had every intention to do exactly what he did. Well, I see, I seen him talking about it on YouTube, and he yeah. said, "Yeah, that's my move. I do that all the time in training." That's awesome. Yeah, that was that was no accident. Yeah, yeah and that is you, awesome. That was twenty two or twenty three minutes into a fight that he had won every minute of. Yeah. Just like you said, it's and, and it's talking about arm bars from the back. There was one of those too. Oh, Fabricio did it straight yeah. out of the combatives. Yeah, I felt bad for that guy. You know, that guy only had like twenty two hours notice. Yeah, or that's what I heard. Yeah, he was. He said he was playing Nintendo, and then he was shortly on a plane, you know, so... Wow. Yeah, it was... Well, hopefully you got a good 25, 30 grand for that plane ride. At least. At so, least. And yeah. Fabrizio did it gently with an arm bar, so he didn't even really take any beating. Yeah. Went in on the easy single, boom, he took the back. Everybody got their money. Yep. The UFC got their money. Those yep. guys got their money. Everybody was good. Nobody was bruised. Yeah. <laughs> it was good you fight again. Yeah. Everybody fights to... tomorrow. Yeah, right. everybody's good to go tomorrow. No, no suspensions. No, yeah, exactly. Nothing. Of course, we could we could say that maybe that's a little convenient. Yeah, but um, and then so, Tony Ferguson can't leave out his triangle. Okay. Yeah, in the in the uh, so main this, event. this is sad because every time I hear Tony Ferguson, I just think of, of the uh, the 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 Saturday Night Live sketch with with uh, Turd Fergler. <laughs> that's hilarious. Like every time, I, hear, I don't know why. It, it's you'd have to look it up. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'd have to look it, it up. I don't think I. It, anyway. Yeah, it doesn't matter. But it's still, it's still, Turd Fergler, it's funny. Yeah, and Turd Ferguson. <laughs> Turd, I called him you Turd Ferguson. Turd. Tony Ferguson yeah. is quietly becoming one of the best fighters in UFC, and he gets no publicity. And he had a perfect, tri- perfect triangle to win the match. Now, now, amazing. what, what wow. is he? What weight class? Uh, same as Connor. He called out Connor after the fight, so we'll see. It makes no Connor sense. Connor ain't fighting in the it UFC, doesn't man. Make, it doesn't make any sense. We've already talked about that. You don't think he will? No. He may, but it won't be him. I mean, I'm willing to be wrong. I, it really turns out they have. I have no say in it, but I don't think he'll... You don't think he'll be a number three? Between I, don't, and... I don't think he will um, do another fight in the UFC. I think he, he has he no will. reason to. I if he does, so. it's only because he wants to. Yeah. He has no need to. Yeah, he might as well just fight CM Punk or something, you yeah. know, at this point. Keep doing go shows on bully, like Go on Bully Beatdown on MTV. Yeah, I mean, a hundred. he made $100 million in the last fight. It's going to be tough. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Can, can you imagine climbing oh the cage goodness. with Nate Diaz for 10? Yeah. Like, like a, after you fought. Because he could go do another bo- boxing max, match and easily make another 50. Yeah. Yeah, easily. absolutely. I, I mean, the reality, I mean, wherever the fight takes place, there's no sense him in and him. Him and Paul, uh, or maybe him and Polly. That's the kind of Malinaji stuff. At least makes sense go at it. Yeah. If I was in Connor's camp, that's exactly what I would be telling him. Do not ever. <laughs> I mean, why would you get in there and fight killers? For essentially what's chump change at this point. Yeah, he made it big. Yeah. yeah he absolutely made it big. And he actually, be, he, he, I was a fan, but I became a super fan after that fight. Because he yeah. did some stuff that was amazing to me against the best pound for pound boxer. I agree 1,000%. Yeah. So let's talk about this book. All right. But first of all, let's talk about the picture on the front. Uh, dude, you look like a total badass. You look like <laughs> Boss Rudin, dude. I, I hope you know that that's going to be the, the thumbnail for, for the, the podcast. Yeah, so picture uh, Boss Rudin in a uh, gi. That's right. what you look like to me right there. I was about 25 pounds you look lighter. like you're about to throw up, actually. It's I, I had just got done training hard, and I my daughter had come around the corner with her phone. Yeah. And she snapped that. She just snapped that picture. Yeah, it's perfect. It's like it's like you're taking you're in the middle of taking a deep breath. It looks like, like yeah. you look exhausted. Yeah, yeah. Just it was, it was at the end of a hard workout. And I, just got I'll, done fighting Tank Abbott. Yeah, somebody. <laughs> I, I mean, I pumped the heat up in my basement too because oh, I mean, it's like my basement dojo. I got oh, the okay. mats and I'll be down there rolling or boxing or whatever. Oh, that's cool, man. Uh, I'll pump it up to about 105 degrees Holy just to Toledo. make it uncomfortable. So uh, you know, the book starts off, um, you know, with your history, right? right? Like, and kind of how you got into martial arts and 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 uh, it's called an introduction to violence, right? Like, so turn your stepfather uh, kind of got you into it for the wrong reasons, right? Like, like yeah, he was. Uh, I mean, he's a, and not all stepdads are like this, but he was an atypical. He was an alcoholic. Uh, I mean, God rest his soul. He's been gone since 1987, but uh, he was abusive. So I, I kind of witnessed some violence at a young age. Um, I grew up in Cleveland, and I. You know, the one thing about the book is by the time you get to the end of it, you can tell that the over 
what the book is about, its message is about ego and the kind of problems it can get us into. And I don't try to paint myself as some type of martial arts action superstar because as the stories will display in the book, uh, there's some punishment that goes on and some getting beat up and some injuries and, you know, getting shot and different things that, uh, you know, it's not like it is on TV. You know, yeah. I know what adrenaline's about, that's for sure. You know, that's, that's amazing. That's amazing. So, um, you know, kind of sticking with the book, uh, there's, there's a section I like. And it, you go on, you talk about like sixth grade. Sixth grade was a real formative year for you. Yeah. yeah. And, and you, know, you got in some fights and stuff like that, right? Um, and, uh, but, but there, there's a section. I'm just going to read this if that's okay. It, oh, okay. Says, it says, lessons I learned from this. And, and from this, talking about the, the fight in, in sixth grade. Right, right. Um, it says, being a gold medalist didn't help me in a real fight. <laughs> real fighting and point sparring were a lot different. I could take a hit. Or I'm sorry, I could get hit a lot more once and the fight wouldn't get broken up for a point tally. Yeah, <laughs> so if anybody, yeah. for anybody who's never done that, like um, a lot of martial arts, like you get all padded up right. and, and like you have like this foam headgear and foam thing and then like, like it's kind of like a, a, a an intricate game of tag. Like, like you Martial know, tag. Yeah, you know, and, and, and like you'll hit and back in the day you hit a little hard but like it's still all padded and it really right. wasn't that big a deal. These days you can kind of like just tap someone on the gear and then and, they're done. You, you even but, blow on them too hard. But, uh, you know, and then, and then like, so it's like, fight! And then, like, you guys go at it, and, and maybe you throw a kick, and it taps the belly, and they're like, time! Stop! Stop! And, you right. know, and they're like, okay, judges call for point, and, like, you know, if the majority of the judges saw it, you get your point. Right, right. right. So, so that's kind of how a lot of those tournaments work. And, and even back in the day, like, what they called full contact point fighting, meaning that you didn't have, like, gear. Right. It was bare knuckle and everything, but they still stopped you for point. Like Chuck Norris was a world champion at that. Bill Wallace, a lot of those guys. Yeah. Um, and I'm not taking away from their abilities or anything, but that's what they were doing. There was always this this kind of stop. You get stopped versus one shot. a real fight where like, all right, I hit him, and then like he keeps coming at you because right. it didn't you know it didn't kill him right. you know and he this still isn't how it, they, this isn't how it happened in the dojo. <laughs> <laughs> I think everybody's first fight's kind of oh, like... Oh, man, yeah. Like, whatever your preconceived notion of what a fight is going to be just gets crumbled. <laughs> You're like... Oh, I experimented, is... though. So yeah. th this is a really good point. That, um, worrying about what my peers thought about me kept me fighting someone I otherwise would have avoided. Yeah. Thanks, ego. Yeah, nice. absolutely. <laughs> uh, because you got to figure, I was in the sixth grade, and I was a normal-sized sixth grader, maybe 105 pounds, yeah. five foot three. And, okay. and and this kid, you know, we were being busted to the east side. This was a big kid. He was probably six foot tall, definitely a future basketball player. Yeah. And he probably weighed 150 pounds. Oh, goodness. And uh, we eventually became friends, but I got beat up a few times before that could happen. And he yeah. finally thought, okay, it's not worth beating this guy up anymore. <laughs> I just I kept, yeah. I kept, I kept challenging him because it's like one of those deals. And this was the same thing when I worked in the prison. It was the same thing going to Cleveland Public Schools. It's the same thing in life. If you let yourself get punked out, don't go back. Yeah. And unfortunately, I had to keep going back. So mm -hmm. it kind of helped me out later on in life. But it, it, the point being is is the ego. Yeah. I, you know, if he'd have beat me up alone in the gym, I probably would look at him and just nodded the next day. Yeah. You know, but because it was in front of people. In front of your Yeah, place. you start going, man, we all got it. We, we all fall victim to that, too. Oh, yeah. I mean... Well, and this brings us to the next thing you were talking about. Bullies don't like it when you stand up to them. Right. Even when they can beat you, uh, even when they think they can beat you up, it ruins their fun and starts to become too much of a risk. Mm -hmm. You know, what if you get lucky and eventually win? So, like, the idea being, like, it, it's just, it's not fun anymore, right? And because, I because I'm thinking they're about doing it because it's so because, true in so many ways. Yeah, and I mean, I've seen it a million mm -hmm. times. Like, like uh, the minute you stand up to a bully... They usually go, oh, whatever, or they start, you know, that's when they're like, oh, fuck you, or, you know, whatever. And, and like, yeah. instead of just, like, picking on you, it becomes, like, very it's different work. situation. Yeah, and it, yeah. Yeah, it becomes work. And believe it, it becomes he almost work. says that. Yeah, you, once it becomes you know, like, work, they're going to stop because they, it, it isn't worth the risk. Because if they get beat up by somebody, it's like fighting a midget. If you get beat up, it's by a midget. If you win, you, well, so what? You beat up a midget. I shouldn't say that on the I show. Say, but, I think uh, it's midget. little people. Little people, I'm sorry. That's okay. I know. It's, uh, it's cool, man. We know you don't mean anything. I don't mean nothing by it. He he watch he he watches. For anybody who doesn't know, I, I edited in midget. He was saying imp because oh, he goodness. watches lots of well, Game of Game Thrones. Game of Thrones, yes. Oh, goodness, I don't know if that's more or less derogatory. It's definitely more derogatory. <laughs> okay. I haven't got like I said. I haven't got for anybody who doesn't get the reference. That's a reference to Game of Thrones. I'm not trying to be rude or whatever. Okay. I just 
If, if you didn't think it was funny, then con- hey, consider it a poor character. attempt at humor. I thought it was funny. Um, so, I mean, like you, you talk a lot about the, um, you know, your, your time in the military uh, and law enforcement in your book. Yes. You know, what, what are some of the things you take away? I mean, again, there's, there's a whole book on this. So, like, right. saying some of them, it's like, well, well, I wrote a book to tell you. Yeah, he said, but read like, my book. <laughs> like, what do you feel you learned about, again, coming back to the whole ego thing, the violence thing, what, what did you get from that? The, the, the ego and violence thing that I got from that, and what I put into the book about, um, and, and I even put somewhere in the beginning of the book that I didn't want to paint a picture of myself that just simply wasn't true. Um, as a Marine, I never served in combat, although I was combat trained in infantry. Sure. Um, as a cop, I never had to de- deploy deadly force. I've had to present it. I've never had to actually shoot anybody, thank God. So I've made, yeah, it, through, I've made it through some professions where I've never had to take a life, and I'm blessed for it. But one of the things, the takeaway is, is I, I wrote about this, you know, as far as the military, my life in the military was less violent than my civilian life. Because of policing. And, yeah, and just, like, just where I grew up. And, and, and what ends up happening in the military, they think that some people think the military is going to turn you into some hand-to-hand combat, you know, expert. It just gets you in shape. <laughs> so, like, if you were in high school and you couldn't fight, well, the military is going to mean you could run better now because you're in shape when you get sure. out of boot camp. Um and it's something I've seen over the years that I talked about too is guys would get out of the military and this is ego. They all would want to talk about how they led troops, how how they did this, how they did that. And it's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. You were a fire team leader in the school of infantry. That's not the same as what you're talking about in leading troops. Right. Um, or they all wanted to act like they were either infantry or special forces or somehow attached to them. And it just got to the point where I said to myself, <laughs> I used to have a joke and call myself, I'd call myself a senior Lance Corporal, which is a non-rated E3 That's rank. Funny. And it's like, you know, where's the guys? Well, you, you know what? Along those same lines, like, like again, I, I was in the military. Right. I served, I'll say, in a war zone. Right. To say that I was in combat is definitely, like, we received some indirect fire, uh, right. mortars, some rockets. But to say that I was in combat would be a bit of a stretch. You know what I mean? Like, right. I never had anybody directly pointing a weapon at me trying to murder me. You know what I mean? Or anybody in my unit. Yeah. So, like, those things just didn't happen to me. Right. But we had guys, and, and uh, specifically this one lieutenant, um, who just, he, it's like he couldn't take that. You know what I mean? Like, he couldn't take that. You know what? He served his role. He did his job. And that's good enough. I know. And, and, and it was to the point where, like, we were fuel suppliers. Right. So we created this huge fuel depot. And, and I forget the exact number, but it was something like a million gallons of fuel at any given time that, right. we, that we were in charge of. Wow. Pumping out, distributing. Uh, and we did pull some security for, for the vehicles coming in and going out. And, right. And there was about a 100-mile stretch of road that, that we had gun teams and stuff that would go up and down each day. Right. But, uh, you know, fortunately, none of them ever got hit. And, and But this one lieutenant, man, he we were in Tikrit. And Saddam Hussein, if you don't know, was caught in Tikrit. Right. Like, like we were right outside Tikrit. Right. In a little, an Air Force base. But, um, and like when we got home, like he had, he just had to cling to something so hard that he was like, you know what, you got, we're all we're literally at home right now, right? We're, we, we just made it back. We marched into our facility. Our families are standing there. Everybody's crying, right? You know, like, right. it's this huge, amazing moment. All we fucking want to do is go hug our families. Right. And he's sitting here telling us this bullshit story about, you know, guys, it was our fuel in the vehicles that captured Saddam Hussein. And we're just thinking, what in the world is wrong with you, dude? Right. Like, that's what you need. I mean, and I guess if that's what you need. too much embellishing, maybe, but I don't know. Who gives a fuck? Right. What, I mean, and I'm sorry that I'm, I'm dropping F-bombs, but these, this is something that, like, really drives me crazy. I see. Right, Like, right. I mean, it gets, it really grinds my gears. Like, we <laughs> Peter Griffin reference. Yeah, there's some guys so, that are like uh, they're they almost are suffering um, survival survivor's guilt because they didn't serve in combat or they didn't get to get on a stick and go 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 in and take down a house or something. I, I've I mean, this that. guy had issues from the get go. Like there was a time like we we one time the, pretty much the first time we got mortared, um, there were these giant bunkers and they made us go huddle in them, and and you feel like a bunch of pussies because here we are the United States Army and we're hung hung hunkered in fallout shelters right. because of mortaring, right? And, and, like, these mortars weren't aimed at shit. There was some guy driving by in his, his little Toyota uh, pickup truck right. launching a few mortars. And, and, and it, was, it was over and done with within, like, 60 seconds. And okay. I'm saying, like, five mortars. Now, it wasn't like it was like, boom, 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 boom. But, you know, it was like, boom. Oh, okay. Boom. Oh, there's another one. 
Oh, okay. Where's right. that aimed at? It's nowhere near us. Like they're just lobbing rocks. Yeah, they're just lobbing them. Imagine like if if you if you get some spitballs, put them in, put and, and like close your eyes and spin around and then just try to shoot them at people. That's still be a That's little disconcerning because like. it could get lucky. That mortar might have your name on it. I guess. And I get that. Like, <laughs> and trust me, I've had a psychologist tell me that my thoughts on this are wrong. But, right. But like it, this didn't feel like that big of a deal. You know what I mean? And, right. But right. like we get out of these bunkers and here's this lieutenant sitting on top of the bunker. Now, I want to let you understand that these bunkers are behind our own lines. Okay. Like, we have a, a, a 20 square mile perimeter. So, okay. So he's in good guy land. Right, right. How sturdy is this bunker? So say a mortar direct hits the bu- bunker. Is he in Oh, it, it was, it, you know, it was probably 45 feet of concrete. So he was safe. You were, you were, a mortar would not do anything to these bunkers. They're designed. Oh, wow. To take the real life. Like, that makes it a little more comfortable, right, Dan? Yeah. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so, so, but okay. I mean, like, one, we never went into them again. Let me point that out. Because, like, eat, they were like, it's hard to explain it, but it looked basically like a, a large parallelogram sitting sitting on top okay, of the ground. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and uh, it, anyway, it, it was so cramped in there. Like, we're, we're fitting, like, 60 soldiers into one bunker designed for, like, six. Yeah, that like, sounds like, like the military. Yeah, it, <laughs> it was just ridiculous. And when we understood that there was no real aiming to this, that there was no real... And it's not like we received them every day. We, we, we created a different SOP, which I'm not going to go over. But point is, we, okay. did, we never went in there again. Right. Um, but we come out of it, and this lieutenant's sitting on top of this thing with his M16, lock cock, ready to roll, like, scanning the, the area. The only thing, for anybody who doesn't understand, imagine him sitting in the middle of a square <laughs> and everything around him is good guys. And he's just pointing a fully loaded, ready-to-go weapon at the backs of good guys. <laughs> like, who are actually designated to be on the lookout yeah. at the perimeter. The jokes like, they make about lieutenants are all true, I swear. I mean, this guy was a moron. And, and then, like, not long after that, he disappeared for weeks. Right. Disappeared. And, and I mean... I, and then he comes back and he's telling us how he was with his brother at the 101, how they, they called him in to help his brother out in, with the 101st Airborne. And we're like, you are so full of shit. Yeah. He went and fought in that Kumite, didn't he? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I him listened and, to you guys talk Frank about Dukes. that one. Yeah, Frank Dukes. I heard you guys that's, talk about that one. But he couldn't talk about that, right? Yeah, he, it, anyway, that's what it was. Man, I got stories perfect, out the yin perfect, about some yeah, of these guys. Perfect. And I wasn't perfect, man. Like, I was not perfect. Like, like right. I fucked up in some ways that, that I wish I could take back. But, right. but uh, you know, like, I, was, I never did stuff like that. Never... Mm. Anyway, yeah, that's a little, it, and, and and in the book, it's the, the smallest part in the book out of my jobs is probably about the Marine Corps because I didn't, I didn't have a uh, super yeah. violent career yeah. in the Marines. I was trained for it, but I never did it. I just always thought it was funny because I would think to myself, especially in law enforcement, all these guys, you know, led troops and we're all in the special. I'm like, where's the cooks and the admin people? Yeah. And and, and people don't think people take orders in the military anymore. Is yeah. everyone just a leader now? Everybody's yeah. the general. It's an ego driven phenomenon when they get out and they get around civilians that they every people want to act like Rambo or, you know, I learned how to do this or I learned how to do that and not really. It's it's yeah. it's it is it's, it's, it's a funny thing. Yeah. Although I will say, like have you ever played paintball? Oh yeah, I love it. Absolutely. Like if you've had any minimal military experience, you are basically Rambo when you play when you play paintball. I was. If you can get like <laughs> ten people to just listen to what you're saying to do, right. you'll run over everybody. Because most people just run around like it's a free for all. Right. And if you get like ten people to act like a squad, yeah. And you can get them in some sort of formation and just tell them, okay, you you go there. Everybody else cover fire. Right. Like you're gonna run over everybody. Right. <laughs> I, I, I put eight guys in a ranger file one time because we were doing yeah. woods ball. And I put him in. I put him in a ranger file. And we, we and I told him if we get attacked from this side, this is what we're going to do. If we get attacked from that side, this is what we're going to do. I explained the concept of a hasty one eighty. Nice. And uh, and we did. We owned him. Yeah, we I mean, owned the other team. We I mean, basic military tactics. Yeah. Overcome disorganization sure. anytime. Absolutely. So anyway, Absolutely. anyway, different story. So um, another chapter in the book, and you know, I'm going to move forward because that's, that's I, because cool. I think this is a really interesting chapter. Are the two types of conflicts, and you talk about like duels. Like agreed upon, like hey, you and I, we're gonna we're gonna throw down, right? Versus self defense. What right. what can you say about that a little bit? Well, a duel, it, it, to me, a duel or agreed upon combat could be any sanctioned fight. It could be every time we're gonna roll. It could be anything. 
Um, we can go out to the parking lot and be like, if we're agreeing to fight. And and, and I, I get into the legalities of it also because fighting is illegal. Sure. So In some states. There's actually some states, states where, where you are allowed I put that to in have, there. Yeah. It's in that book. And I actually got a link in there where you can watch an agreed upon fight with that superhero. I've seen this. Yeah, the superhero the guy. Cops stand and let him fight because it's legal. You're allowed Until to. Until somebody hits the ground, you're right. allowed to keep fighting. Which is crazy because the ground is where it's safest. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I, I, and this guy had fought MMA too, so this superhero yeah, had some skills. He, too, he had yeah. done some stuff, and I, I thought it was just—I thought it was pretty cool that they had that. But is it, that it, Washington? It seems like. Yeah, it is Washington, Washington, Washington State. It seems like that's where it was. Yeah, Washington State. So I—I I, I broke down that difference because, to me, when you when it's self-defense, you're not a willing participant. Yes. You are not a willing participant in this conflict when it's self-defense. And I couldn't go from agreed upon compact or, or, or agreed upon to, to non-agreed upon. Yeah, as soon as you start getting beat up, it probably goes to non-agreed upon. But if you if you decide to partake in something, you're agreeing to a fight. And um, in real life, that's illegal. And I get into the legalities just a little bit. I don't want to overshoot the legalities because I think there's a lot of people out there who do. Yeah. And, and in my opinion, it's because they lack substance as far as martial arts techniques are concerned. Yeah. So they overshoot what they know about the law. But they're, you're going to have somebody afraid to do anything if you're not careful. I've seen, I watch students shake their heads like, what can I do then? You know, it, 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 needs, to, it needs to be covered, but not over covered. That's, that's yeah, basically, yeah. you know, what I think about it. Um, it when you talk about, when you talk about a situation that's self-defense, you are not a willing participant. You have been attacked. More than likely, you've been caught off guard. Yes. You more than likely didn't see it coming. Mm. Or you had like a split second, like you catch a glimpse of something. Well, that's, so, and this is another thing you talk about in the book. It's kind of like the levels of preparedness, right? Right, like, yes. Uh, you, you like white through black. Like white, you're unprepared, unready. Like you're just with your buddy and all of a sudden, boom, you're in a conflict. You didn't even know it was coming. Right. Versus black where like... You know, you you're, know stuff's going you're crazy. You're yeah. done. You're panicked. Right. Uh, and and the, the example you use is the video of that uh, that girl who was getting dragged out of the supermarket. I think right. And and uh, was oh, like kicking and screaming. Loud, yeah. And like like she's just panicked. She's not doing anything useful. Right. She's just screaming and yelling and getting pulled away. And then the mom comes in and grabs thank her God legs. grabs her. But yeah. You know, and and I'll, I'll point out that that's also probably the most rare form of abduction. But like right. Anyway. Well, the one the one girl who was uh, getting abducted and she fought her way out of it, she used a technique that um, I've actually seen you teaching here before. You, you grab your own hand and it's your whole body and arm versus the attacker's thumbs. Yeah. And you pull out of it and run. Um, she was able to do that. Good for her. So, and, and luckily, because that was really out of a Taekwondo and Hapkido school, I think that was the only valid thing we taught that a kid could even do. Because most of the time they were just doing katas and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, I watched that video and that one really shook me. Like, I didn't realize that when you say the most rare, yeah, I didn't even realize that was a thing. Oh yeah, I mean, like, you know what I mean? Like, I didn't realize that people were literally grabbing people out of supermarkets and trying to drag them. It's away. incredibly rare. I mean, that is that, most abductions, and when I say most, I'm talking eighty to ninety percent happen mm-hmm. by someone that is known. It's the, the statistics mm-hmm. between, uh, especially like female abduction and female. Uh, and, and like sexual uh, abuse or sexual assault right. um, or rape, most of those things happen by someone that they were familiar with. I talk yeah. about that in the book. Uh, or... Quite often a family member, yeah. uh, you know. Somebody they meet at a party and they feel yeah. comfortable with. They They've been drinking a little bit. Yeah, I'll take a ride home. And Yeah, and, and they'll be like, oh, this is just Johnny. He's cool taking me home. Like maybe right. she knows him from work or something mm-hmm. like that. And one thing leads to another. Abduction, again, usually a family member. And in most cases of abduction, uh, you have to when you when you look up the statistics on this, and I know this from when I taught self defense at Youngstown State. Um, when you look up the statistics, you, you almost need to take out some of them and, and kind of reevaluate them because a lot of them are parental, uh, disputes. parental disputes where Absolutely. someone was given custody and right. dad took took daughter on the wrong day. But a letter of the law, yeah, but not by it's federally. Not, it's yeah. a, it's, a, it's right. a child abduction, but it might honestly be a mistake or, right. or just like well. You know, screw you! I'm taking you anyway, and, right. and we're going to go to the amusement park. Like, and all of a sudden, he's a kidnapper. Yeah, I seen. I, now, the, those technique, those usually get dropped. They're, but they still go into those. Yeah, because they got to get behind. They want to get to the culpable mental adjust. state or the intent. And if the culpable mental state or the intent isn't to commit the crime, right? Usually, it's going to get dropped. And I talk about asocial and social violence. 
yeah. and, and I break down the difference between those two. And um, uh, asocial violence is the stuff of nightmares. It is that psychotic sociopathic predator. Yeah. But that doesn't happen a lot. That's no. not as nowhere near as the social kind, because the social kind is basically usually young men or guys beating their chests. Yeah. Well, and you know what? To that point, you, you bring it up. Um, it's it's in chapter four. Ego. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the first line of the chapter um, says, "Something as fragile as the human ego, in my opinion, it is the second leading cause to most conflicts on both a personal as well as global level, second only to greed." Yeah, I love that. Yeah, absolutely, that's yeah. impressive. I love that. Yeah, like like that is a great great thing to say like a lot of times appreciate that thank you and, and i i think it's so true like, like you you feel like oh you know what i just threatened this dude and now i have to back it up right like i have to right everybody's watching right right and it comes back to what we talked about earlier where like, like you know what uh you know i would have avoided a lot of situations but there were people watching yeah y you know and it comes down to greed or, or in this case ego and, and vanity right sure mm -hmm. absolutely you, you know it's like oh i can't look like a, a wimp now Right, right. Yeah. When, when in reality, like you should have been like, you know what, buddy, you do that again, I'm going to kick your ass, and he and he does it again, and you're like, you know what, screw it, I'm just going to buy you a beer. Let's it, just be. And that's this. and that's part of it too. And part of it, like it's hard. You called my you bluff. <laughs> right, exactly. And or really, when someone comes in your front yard and, and it's it's a friend of yours, an old friend, they start talking a bunch of smack, and it, it's really hard for you to, hey, I'm going to go inside the house and call the police. Well, in the state of Ohio, that's what you better do. Yeah. Unless he's trying to get into your house. And or has a weapon, and you could, you know, reasonably explain to, you know, to a judge or a jury that, hey, he was breaking into my house. He had really bad intentions. I had no choice but to use force on him. Yeah. That's any force. That's just not deadly force. Um, if you decide to go out and fight him in your front yard because it's your property and, you, and something bad happens, I've seen guys catch cases, do eight years in prison mm. because they beat up somebody who did that. Well, yeah. you, you know, an interesting story, and, and, you know, you always hear it, but, like, uh, one of our members. I, now we went, we went down to uh, my head instru or my instructor's school on Wednesday, and uh, he came down with us. I'm not going to use his name. Uh, maybe we, we should bring him on sometime. Okay. But uh, you know, he was telling me he he's like, yeah, I have a friend. He has he has not one but two friends who are in prison for that very problem, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. involuntary manslaughter. Two cases. One happened in a. Uh, it, it was he, like the, the friend was like picking on one of the janitors and they were just picking back and forth right and the janitor came up and pushed him a little bit so he pushed him back the janitor tripped and fell and hit his head on a bandsaw cut his head open and killed him Jeez, oh, oh my god yeah prison there's no guy, intent guy for that to prison. but it was the, it the act was illegal that's why he got involuntary manslaughter yeah and, and then and the other one was your classic punch got punched hit hit head hit the curb died I knew that happened to I knew a guy that happened to too yeah He's still in prison don't let ego get you on those things, guys. No, yeah, you can't. And you know what? There's going to be anger there, and you got to check your anger. You know, yeah. sometimes it ain't always fear that's going to make you act. It could be anger, and and that's usually where the ego is. And, and ego jumps on him, and this guy's on my property. Call the police. Let the police it's, do their job. Give them a chance to do their job. And the hardest part is, and I don't. Oh man, I don't want to turn this into a sexist debate, but for young men, yeah, like old guys like us, it's easy to make wise decisions. Right. But when you're young, I would say from like 16 to 25, you're essentially a crazy person. <laughs> right. do, do you know what I mean? If you really think about it, just the going yeah, crazy. Yeah, you're so and, compelled yeah. by social status. Right. Right. You know what I mean? You guys, it's not just it's ego as well, but it's it's more that social status. Right. Do you it know is. what I mean? And it is, and it's, and I think that's part of the human condition is we all have a need to feel like we belong. Mm. And we all have, we all have, I mean, some basic, just real needs that you would, like to be a part of something bigger than yourself, like to be a part of, you know, this academy. Yeah. Um, it, it's a big deal to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't agree more. They say that's why one of the best things you can do for a child that's being bullied is find them something else to be a part of. Yes. Other than just school. And get self-esteem and get confidence back up because I don't care who you are. I've had my confidence shaken before. And it doesn't matter. It could happen to anybody. Yeah. So, so you have to... So even beyond, like, martial arts and confidence and stuff, I, I mean, even, like, a club. Sure. Like the Cub Scouts. Right. Just, just being a part of a group. Volleyball. Yeah, sports, where, where, you got, something. where you're part of a group and not, you know what I mean, the social outcasts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have something of your own. Yeah, so right. it's, the you, people you know, at school, yeah, it's them. You know what I mean? You can disconnect. Do you know what I mean? Right. Yeah, for for me, growing up, it was, it was martial arts for sure. That, you know, that was me. I started, yeah. I started when I was five, and I... 
I had a small break in there, but not very much of one. And then, uh, you know, I was also in the Boy Scouts, did a lot of camping and stuff like that. And yeah. those were my things. Like, if pressures of school or whatever got me down, yep. that's what I did. Those were your escapes. Martial yeah. arts, that was mine. I mean, yeah, and I was good at them. Right. You know, I mean, I'm not, a, you know, the best in the world by any means, but I'm still pretty damn good yeah and, so. and and you know not that's not to sound egotistical it's just right. the way yeah, it is reality. i mean right. you are too you know yeah. so is ed when you can when you compare to people who don't do it right they, oh yeah they have no clue right that, right and, and i mean they won't until they do it um but uh yeah i mean it's funny because i got my one department um i'm not going to name them names or anything but I, I when i was a defensive tactics instructor and i taught ground defense i taught i was certified to teach they send you through school. You you learn and told you're told what to teach. On that department, you know, hey, I'm like I'm like Hoist Gracie on that department, right? <laughs> and I come into a jujitsu school, and oh yeah, I'm finding out I'm nowhere near as good as I thought I was out there. So yeah. it's, it's great, actually. I love it. It's humbling. Uh, yeah, I think it is for everybody. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so one of the last chapters in the book um, is about finding a good martial arts and, and, and I mean. Guys, I'm purposely not going through the whole book because I want you to read it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but but uh, it's about finding a good instructor. And, you know, it's funny because when you wrote this, you and I hadn't met. No. But this is basically talking about me. <laughs> I mean, it, no, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, it, you no, know what? So, it honestly, it is. And now that I've met it, you, absolutely. It, uh, it has a quote here. And, and I think this quote is very important. Um, <clears throat> And it's something I've heard Pedro Sauer say. It's something that I've heard every, what I would call, good martial arts instructor say, in one form or another. This, this quote happens to come from, from uh, Felipe Costa, who is a very well-respected uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu instructor. It says, those who forbid their students to train and learn from other teachers or academies must be very insecure. Mm. I would never deny my student the opportunity to improve by training with others. And I mean that right there just Learn brings to let it your down. students go. Tell them to come back to you with what they learn. Yeah. Because you'll learn something then, and, you know? And Pedro Sauer says that all the time. As a matter of fact, I was just at one of his seminars over the weekend and he was saying almost word for word that exact same thing. That's awesome. He was he was like, I'm you getting know, goosebumps I'm, because even to be mentioned you in really the same have goosebumps. I do. To be I mentioned see them. to be mentioned in the same <laughs> sentence with a, yeah. a guy like Pedro Sauer is uh, yeah, that's wow. Okay, that's cool. I'm glad yeah, that you awesome, like that man. one. Yeah, no, I you remember how shocked I was when I found out that was a thing? What? The, the, oh, yeah. Because, like, the environments, I've only done martial arts a few places, but every place I've done it, it was always, yeah, for sure, go train with them. Right. Get better. Let's all get I better. I got a guy, a he's a young man, he's home from the Marine Corps. He's one of only two people I've ever promoted to black belt. Okay. And when he was in Okinawa, he, he, he called me up when we were talking. He was like, hey, there's a, two different jiu-jitsu places on base. There's a Goshen jiu-jitsu and a Brazilian jiu-jitsu. You know, do you care if I do those? Um, and if you, you know, if you don't, he was like... Which one should I do? And I'm like, which one you should do? And, and he's like, yeah. I was like, well, do them both. Yeah, yeah. Do them both. Why not? See which I one learned, you like every, better. Learn everything you could learn. Which one works best for you? Yeah, you know, I, personally, after doing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, I'm kind of addicted to it. Yeah. And and, yes. and, I, and I'll just say this. I know it's on the podcast. Um, I was in the hospital in Maine. I felt like I almost died, not because of what was wrong with me, but because of the medication. Yeah. And when I was coming in and out of consciousness, and I wrote a little article on it called The Puzzle. And it came to me because of jujitsu. The martial art that I was thinking about while I was almost dying was jujitsu. Oh yeah, it was the puzzle of being able to get around an open guard, a spider guard. <laughs> Things I'm getting smashed at in here when I try to do, but yeah. it's, it's uh, it, it really is to me. After a whole life of striking, not nothing against striking, but I realized at 46 years old, my type two twitch muscle fibers. Mm -hmm. I'm not in a couple of years, especially. Am I going to even be able to hold my own with an average amateur kickboxer in the ring? Probably not, but in 10 years, because of jiu-jitsu, I could probably still be a threat to anybody. Yeah. And, and my body isn't going to be all sh is as shattered. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, it's not without. It's not without risk. It's got lots injury. of injuries. I think yeah, the I injuries mean, could be de very debilitating, but it, it's, you know, and Bill's a good instructor. He's told me not to roll at certain times because, you know, I was trying to be a Met Savage. Yeah, <laughs> I was trying to be We a were Met talking Savage. about Mr. Jiu-Jitsu. Yeah, we were talking about him. Yeah, I, did, uh, I love that guy. I do, too. I do too. I love his yeah. His posts I'm a, are incredible. Oh, they're I hilarious like his, too. His posts are awesome. Yeah. What Good was that stuff. one post he put up recently? I shared it too, and, and LOL'd it. It was uh, something about someone saying they wish they could train more, 
Oh yeah! Oh yeah! He oh so god! That he, was on their he, Facebook. Did, he did like a four minute stock of their Time Facebook line, page. And was like, well, I see you on Friday. Line. You were out, you know, doing this, you spent and on three hours Saturday doing on this, <laughs> and Sunday doing this, and then you bought that. He goes, it sounds like you got plenty of money and time to be training. Yeah, you and the guy's like, to. you're gonna stalk my Facebook page? Fuck you! <laughs> That's so funny. That is funny. Sometimes but you ask you ask a question. They are real because we hear it all the time. You know what I mean? Like people say, oh, I ain't got the time. Time or I ain't got that, and, and I get it. You know, whatever you, you try it, maybe it's just not for you. Maybe, maybe you know, maybe you think you don't have the time. But I find that anything that's important enough to you, you can make the time and find the money for. Yeah, you know what I mean. I, I bet that if absolutely if, if someone came up to you right now and was like, "Hey, you know what? You, your axle on your car is broken. It's going to cost seven hundred bucks to, to fix. You're going to find that seven hundred bucks. Sure, you either find you an it. excuse or you find a way. And yeah. when, you, when you like it and, and you know, like you just you find it. Like right. If it's that important to you, you'll figure it out. I agree. So I, I just I, I felt when I kept thinking about it is what is self defense? And self defense really is 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 accumulation of good daily habits and a good lifestyle. And, you know, who wants to have a life where you have to defend yourself in the first place? You want to you want to self protection is what it's more about. I can agree more. Yeah. And to me, jujitsu is if you get good at it. And even if you're mediocre at it against your average street urchin, you know, I think self defense is a cool side effect. And, and yeah. for me personally, I just think I love I love it because I like. I mean, I love yeah, to do it. It's, and I say that all the time. Like, like self defense is the is the like yeah the side effect the of training, right? Yeah. Like that's the byproduct, right? Um, I always defined it when I when I was teaching it as a class it was. Uh, you know, any action you take to protect yourself or those around you, and yeah, and, yeah. and that that could be eating right. That could be sure. that could be you know just smart habits. That, right. And that's why I made it so broad and vague because everybody thinks self defense and they think okay I'm going to learn to punch and then like day one I'm teaching them like hey you, you know I would look at the, my, the uh, students in there and of course these are a bunch of college students most right. at that time didn't right. know their ass from the hole in the ground but uh, they they would I, I'd be like hey what's what's the phone number to your local sheriff's department and they'd be like uh what I'm like okay how about fire department uh. Uh, you know, and it's like, sure. okay, good. Your yeah. homework is the I've got my thing. police department number memorized. Yeah, and, and I mean, <laughs> I mean, the, now it's nine one one. At the time, we didn't have nine one one in our thing. But, right. yeah, but like, even if you need the the non the not, and now we've also got our phone. I can literally go to my phone and go, okay, Google, call yeah. Cuyahoga Falls, call Cuyahoga Falls, Cuyahoga Falls Police Department, right, and it'll right. do that, right? But but at that point, you, you didn't have that. Your but point is still valid. Understanding, very valid, understanding yeah. that like self defense is much less about fighting and a lot more about just smart habits. And you teach a lot of children. And and, and, well, and what's your address? Yeah, if you had to call the police and give your address, what's your address? Because yeah. a lot of six year olds might not know their address, or seven or eight year olds, they don't. Mm -hmm. hmm. So that's yeah, very important stuff. Um, you, you know, and it's like you said, it's all these habits and micro habits and things you do, like like yep. situational awareness is uh, yeah. incredibly and, and, and it is. And I talk about it in the fourth in the fourth chapter I start getting into and it's about ego the chapter's named ego but I talk about manipulators I talk about um, some of the different things that could have you too preoccupied to even see an attack coming regardless if you're you can be a tenth to read black belt and everything in the world and if you someone's in your head good yeah. luck on seeing it coming you know is, is when I drive around town the biggest vulnerability I see and I, almost everybody is guilty of this Oh, yeah. People walking around staring at their phones. Oh God! Yes, got you know, phones. Regardless phones. of what environment they're in, right. their face is in their phone, which is not only distracting, but if you stare at light and you're in a dark place and you go to look around, can't you see can't anything. see. Right? Do you know? You know what I mean? You're essentially blinding yourself temporarily and distracting yourself and just wandering around. Just I, I think there's some good information in there for somebody who who doesn't know anything about martial arts. And they might take something away from it that they'll, that'll make them think. And I, I, I put some stuff in there about active shooters also, um, and, and what you should do during an active shooter, what you may do uh, if you're going to be on the phone. Realize this 911 operator has probably had panic calls already, yeah. has not been able to ask certain questions because people have hung up. You're in an active threat environment. You can't stay on. And if you do get on there, be prepared to give a description of yourself. Yeah. Because, and that's especially if you, you don't need to engage this person, and in fact, you probably shouldn't, even if you are a CCW holder. But what happens if you get put into a situation where I have to engage him? Because there's no way out from this direction. Here's my kids. And you know what? That brings up a, a something that, um, 
was online uh, recently in in a forum called Martial Arts Nerds on on Facebook. Okay, remember that that it was that it was this video of a guy tackling an, a quote active shooter. It wasn't. It was like a training video, right? Oh yeah, and the, the guy it, with the plastic machine. Gun. Yeah, and yeah. this guy's holding like what, what what you would call like a red man gun. He's got like a AK. a rubber duck, a fake yeah. a fake machine gun, right? Because right. they're just practicing. He's got a little bit of head headgear on. It, it'd be like akin to like a boxing headgear, and it just shows a guy tackling the guy from behind, and uh, then kind of like mock striking him in the back of the head and like sliding the gun away. And it's got all these horrible comments with it. Like, this is the most horrible thing I've ever seen. This is terrible. Good way to get your friend shot. Uh, you, you know, what kind of strikes are those supposed to be? Oh, my goodness. And I remember, Ed, you were kind of, you kind of brought it up to me in kind of that same light. My I problem said, was the machine gun that was laying on the ground the entire time. Yeah, well, it was in their hand at first, right? And well, they yeah, happened but, to drop it. Yeah, that was my problem. Like, One, I don't think the person's going to drop it when they get tackled. That that, so, that was my problem. Um, is that the struggle should have been for the weapon? Did you guys ever see the guy who was killing active shooting, and he had already killed one or two people, and had wounded like two or three more with a shotgun at a college? He was in the middle of reloading, mm -hmm. and a civilian security guard, a student security guard, yeah. pepper sprayed him and tackled him at the same time. And there's a pause in there that I talk about. And when you first get attacked, it don't matter who you are, you're gonna pause. You're, you're, no matter you how fast you've, you've got a, you've your got your mind has situation. to adjust it to it. Like, yeah, and even if happened? you're like what super is it, the trained. OODA loop? Or something yes, like that? yes, yes. So that that loop happens. You have to pause. Well, even this bad guy paused. He paused. Like he wasn't expecting that attack because yeah. he's the one in charge now. He, everyone's afraid of him now. So when I get goosebumps thinking about that too, because when he got attacked, he paused. So sometimes just teaching people to. You yeah, just gotta know when to that, fight. And, like I didn't. I'm not gonna get into arguments on Facebook right. or whatever because yeah, that's me, fruitless. But like, either. I didn't comment. My my thing with this is all these people are making these these horrible comments about it, and I'm not saying the technique was good. Were they attacking like, the technique? Yeah, they're attacking oh, yeah. everything about it. And, and oh, like, they're taking the shit out. Like, wow. and, the, and the, again, keep in mind, this is like he he's tackling like you're wearing, for anybody who doesn't know, like like Dan sitting here, he's wearing like khakis and a t-shirt and a hat, right? All the the guy was dressed just like you, except for he had a like a boxing headgear on. He didn't have like red man suit where you could hit him hard, like, like, <laughs> right? Yeah. And so the guy okay. like gets tackles him from behind, and he's like sitting on his small back and kind of like tapping him on the back of the head. And everybody's like, "What kind of punches are those supposed to be?" And blah blah blah. And it's like, what do you expect? There is no right technique for this. No, like you are in, a, and you talk about stress and, and adrenaline and what that does to you in your right. book. Um, but, like, there's no right technique for that. And someone else was like, and I was glad it got countered, but, like, someone was like, well, that's a good way to get everybody in front of him shot. And someone just countered and said, wasn't that what this guy was doing anyway? Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. he was shooting people anyway. Right, right. Like, what, what is it? Just don't don't talk. I, I think Hollywood. Yeah, and people wanted, like, some, like, cool stripping technique to take the gun away and then right. shoot him. And it's like, what's really going to happen in, in real life is you're going to tackle this guy from behind. He is immediately going to roll over to face you, because that's what people will do, and then you're going to be in a fight for the gun. That was my problem. You know what I mean? That's where the fight's probably yeah. going to be. Essentially, my problem, which you may or may not win. My problem was more yeah, with that's... the bad guy than the good guy. Yeah. My problem was that he just gently double legged him from behind, palm striked him, and the guy just laid there with the machine gun sprawled out on the ground. Yeah. It, it's yeah, because he wasn't being realistic enough about what he's actually going to do. Yeah, but, but again, for all we know. Five minutes later, they did that. You know what I mean? Like Fair it's enough. one clip from a, sure, a training yeah, that was probably absolutely. an hour and a half long. Maybe they did. I get you. You know Maybe what I mean? There like was twenty different scenarios. He I mean, do this. You can make jujitsu look completely useless too. Yep. I could. I could easily do that. Yep. For People sure. try it all the time. When, you yep. know, we did it with our stupid martial arts videos, right? Stab, 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 stab. stab. What if I pull this knife out in the middle? Stab, 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 stab. Yeah. That's okay. Hilarious. Great. But like, none of this is going to be so frozen in time. You're freezing one moment of chaos. Yes. That's all practicing martial I arts agree does. With you that. It takes those yeah. moments of chaos and freezes them. Yeah. You, and, like, and you did something happen. I really liked the one time in here, and you posted a video of it. And I thought it was freaking awesome. You had it was a couple of your purple belts. I think it might have been Kindle and someone else, if I can say their name. But they, yeah. they were out there that rolling. Was Kendall and Eric. Yeah. yeah, they're out there rolling. And they're good roll with each other. Just, mm -hmm. you know, out there rolling. All of a sudden, boom, wooden knife gets thrown in. Or I don't know what kind of knife it was, but you threw in a training knife, and boy, did that role change. Yeah. And boy, it sure did. Well, yeah, if, if you remember, there was a lot of crap that got said about that, too, because yeah. because Kendall, in defense, grabbed the blade to strip the weapon away. And like a bunch of people were like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever seen. So then I did a Facebook Live video 
On the knife thing. On yes. the knife. And, yes. and, and I, I'm sitting in my kitchen, and, and for anybody listening, don't try this at home. I tried it as soon as you did it. Yeah, but... <laughs> Sorry. But like, and I had people like text me, and they're like, "Dude, I couldn't stop watching. That was amazing." But all I said was, and I got a couple relatively sharp knives. You know, I didn't like make sure that they can like cut molecules of air or anything. Right, but, right. But but uh, you know, and I just said, "Look, a knife cuts when it moves, not when it, it when it's static. It's fine. You, you know, you can squeeze that pretty damn hard, right. and manipulate it and not get cut. And more importantly, when it's between having it thrust." Heart deep into your chest, All right? Or grabbing or, it on your or hand, or cutting I'll your take hand the stitches up. later. Yeah, yeah, I think that's what was lost in the whole debate. To be yeah. honest with you, and like, is that any? I'm not, I'm, again, there's no person. right technique. Is it Hollywood that does this? Yes. I mean, this is Hollywood causing people. Hollywood to think and a bunch of people who think that they know what they're doing. <sighs> yeah, violence is very dynamic. It's a, it's a, especially fighting. It's just. It's chaos. it's chaos. It is. It is. There's this, there's, it is very chaotic. And the best thing you can do in training is just to train hard, have some cardio, and, and learn how. And that's why I like jiu-jitsu so much. You get comfortable in uncomfortable positions. It may not stop me from getting beat up, but I'm getting comfortably beat up. Or I'm saying to myself, fuck shit, fuck shit. But my mind's working. Yeah. I, 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 I'm not getting, you know, I'm not panicking. You I know, know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. You don't get that from anything. I've no. never gotten that from anything else. That ability the, just the to only, slow the it only down. Other Kickboxing, thing I would say, I, when I'm getting yeah. hit, I, and, and, and then there's, you know, this guy was a good boxer, and, and he had me um, on the ropes near the corner, and you know, you, what I, you get this, you put your guard up, you still got to learn how to relax and move your hips yeah. as you're taking the yeah, shots. Yeah. Any a live martial art will yeah. teach you that. But, yeah. but the problem with kickboxing and boxing and all those is you're getting hit in the head over and over and over again, sure. and you can't do that on a daily basis. No. Jiu-jitsu, you can do. Almost daily. Sure. At, at a relatively high intensity. If I had to get shoulder surgery I, after the initial month, yeah, I, I, I plan on at least drilling one-armed. If yeah. I, you know. I mean, and you will, and you'll be better for it. Yeah. I can't wait to no grips November. Yeah, we're going to hold tennis balls and train. It's going to be great. Good times. Well, listen, Ed, do we have anything else? Uh, I mean, I think that's pretty much everything. Yeah, guys, the name of the book is, is Violence and Ego. I want you guys to check this out. Violence and Ego, it's written by Daniel Arnold. Uh, it's, uh, I, I keep wanting to say Balboa pu- Publishing, but it's... it's uh, Balboa Press. Oh, it is Balboa. Yeah, it is Balboa, Balboa Press. Balboa Press. Because like, I keep thinking of... Um, they're a subsidy. They're, they're owned by Hay House also. Okay. So Hay House is a real big publisher. But I mean, you can get it from Amazon. You can get it any local bookstore uh, should, Nook, should be it, able to get it. It's on Nook, Kindle, Amazon... Um, you know, it's, it's it's out there in ebook form. It's out there in in soft cover form. Yeah. Sweet. Well, listen, Dan. I mean, I know that you had to rearrange your schedule to be here with us today. I really appreciate that. I'm, oh, thank I'm glad you. This you is awesome. To be on the podcast. Thank you so much. Um, you, you know, so I, I'm I'm really excited. Uh, in other news, Star Wars trailer dropped. Did anybody see that? I did not see that. When you is that coming that? out? We got oh my date? gosh, December. It's December. December. That's yeah. awesome. I'm super excited. Star Wars trailer dropped. Justice League trailer dropped. I see. I decided I get more excited about the build up to the Star Wars movies than the actual. Oh, movies. dude, you got to see this trailer. It's amazing. Is it? Yeah. The last one. Was they show good. more of Luke Skywalker in this one. They show a little bit more of him, and like, like so, I mean, it's a trailer. I can't sure. really spoil it, right? Right. Yeah. So, like, there's this scene where like Ray's doing some some lightsaber kata or nice. whatever, and and, and uh, dare like you insult lightsabers, like <laughs> and like she does something, and like the ground splits, like like kind of like an earthquake, not a not a big one, but like a little split. And Luke looks up at her with like this WTF look, and he's like, "I've only seen power like this one other time, and I wasn't smart enough to fear it, mm. you, you know, or I didn't fear it then. Wow, now I'm smart enough to now. It, like, and, and I think he's alluding to uh, Kylo Ren. Mm. So like I, I think we're, they're gonna you know who knows, everybody's of course got their opinions on what it's gonna be but it looks like it's gonna be phenomenal really yeah I'm oh, super I can't excited wait to see it I can't wait to see it I'm a huge I can't wait I'm to a see big Thor Star Thor's coming out too in November oh there's a lot of good yeah, stuff there's a lot of good out. stuff coming out maybe we'll do a review for some of these things okay. now I know you don't get into the the Marvel movies as much not too much but the Star Wars movie I'm still in yeah we'll definitely be talking yeah, I'll about get that. In on that still cool so um, yeah that that's gonna be exciting definitely go watch that trailer. Awesome. All right, guys, that is all we have for you today. Um, again, Dan, thanks for being on the podcast. Yeah, yeah, guys, you. buy his book, was, uh, Violence and Ego. Ed, how can people get a hold of us? The same ways as always, man. Uh, Google. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm Google? The, yeah, you can G- uh, Gmail. Yeah, he's still, blackbelttips at gmail.com. <laughs> blackbelttips on sick. Facebook. And uh, Black Belt Tips the website, blackbelttips.com. All right, sounds great. Man, Definitely man, shoot us a couple emails. Tell us how much you love Star Wars or hate Star Wars. Uh, definitely pick up the book. Is there people Guys, that hate Star Wars? There are. 
That's so fun. Like, I, I don't even understand we, how that. Well, we called we but. called them wrong. Yeah, I mean, it's just fun. <laughs> yeah. Like I don't know. If you if you hate Star Wars, you hate fun. It's just yeah. you know what I mean. It's it's not to be taken seriously. It's just for two hours of detachment. All right, uh, guys. All right. This has been Black Belt Tips. Sorry. I am Bill. This is Ed, and we're out. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. Awesome. Thanks.